Today I begin the final message in the series on the life of Jacob, and I'm convinced it's really what I've been supposed to share, because it's been about the idea of how do we trust God when life is confusing? And that's kind of where it's been lately for us as a church family. We've, we've, keep, we've kept pursuing options, and then God's kept closing the doors. And sometimes when we get in the midst of that, it gets really frustrating and confusing. And that's often the way it was for Jacob. And I told you, although I planned this series about a year ago, I'm totally convinced God knew that we were going to be dealing with this. Time and time again, God works through the lousy things that happened to Jacob, and he brings about something good. Um, now, if I were to ask you, what is your favorite song? We would get all kinds of song names. But I found a list this week that I want to share with you of the songs with the weirdest names. Now, I, I must confess, I did not look every one of these up. I looked about four or five of them up, and they, they appear to all be real songs. Here's the list, number 10. How can I miss you when you won't go away? <laughs> if the phone doesn't ring, you'll know it's me. A little bit of insults. When you leave, walk out backwards so I'll think you're coming in. <laughs> this one's really bad. And I looked this one up. This one is a real song. If I shot you when I'd wanted, I'd be out by now. Number six. If you won't leave me alone, I'll find someone who will. <laughs> this next one's terrible. I'm so miserable without you, it's almost like you're here. <laughs> okay, number four. Sorry I made you cry, but at least your face is cleaner now. This next one's obviously a country song. Take me to the cornfield, darling, and I'll kiss you between the ears. Number two. If my nose was running money, I'd blow it all on you. Yeah, these are terrible. And number one, this was actually an internet hit. All the oils in Texas, but the dipsticks are in D.C. Sometimes you come across something that you just, ha it, it just captures a thought. We're coming to the end of Jacob's life in our study today. And aging is never an easy thing. Some of you are dealing with aging parents. Some of you are dealing with aging yourselves. I don't know who first said it, but I think I first heard it from Charles Swindoll. He said, aging isn't for sissies. And it's not. I can tell you from experience with my father and what he's going through, aging is not an easy thing. It was not easy for Jacob either. He's getting older and life begins to pass him by. He is going through some real challenges. If you have found Genesis 37, we're going to read 36 verses, but we're going to start by reading just the first 11 verses. So if you will, please follow along. Genesis 37, we'll read verses 1 through 11 to get started. So Jacob settled again in the land of Canaan where his father had lived as a foreigner. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Billa and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. One night Joseph had a dream and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly my bundle stood up and your bundles all gathered round and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, so you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams. 
and the way he talked about them. Soon Joseph had another dream, and again he told his brothers about it. Listen, I've had another dream, he said. The sun, the moon, and eleven stars bowed low before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well as his brother, but his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. Would you pray with me? God, open our hearts and minds to your message for us today. God, sometimes we deal with negativity in our lives, as Jacob and Joseph were dealing with today. And yet, God, you remain God, no matter what's going on in our lives. And I pray that you would help us to understand and grasp that in a fresh way today. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's start with the first principle of the message. We struggle to learn from our mistakes. How many of you have certain things that you struggle with that you seem to make the same, the same kind of mistakes over and over again? Many of us are kind of like that. You know, my temper is usually not an issue for me. I don't have a really bad temper. But I have other things which give me absolute fits. And I suspect if you're completely honest, you will, you will understand that you have some things that cause you problems too. It's interesting because in the story, Jacob is finally home. Home in the sense of near his father. He is finally back where he had left over 20 years earlier. In the story, the teenager Joseph now is learning to shepherd his father's flocks and he is paired up with four of his brothers, the brothers who are the sons of one of these secondary wives. And Jacob obviously loves Joseph far more than he loves any of the other children. And as you can imagine, when there is favoritism in a family, what happens? It always creates what? Jealousy, conflict, and it absolutely works that way this time too. Now, Jacob feels less affection for the sons of the slaves, of the slave wives, and matters aren't made better when Joseph reports to his father something they're doing of which he knew his father wasn't going to approve. Having personally experienced the sad consequences of favoritism in his own home, he should have recognized that it was a disaster. You know what? We relate to our children each differently because our children are different. But we can't play favorites. You have to love each of your children, and they're each unique, aren't they? What one struggles with, the next one doesn't. One of them's strong point is not a strong point that the others have, but you, you have to love each of them. In fact, look at this next statement in your notes because it really makes the point that I'm making here. Next statement in your notes says, your children aren't the same. You don't have to love them the same, but you should love each one equally. So you're going to relate to each of your children differently. That's fine. But your children shouldn't be able to look around and say, oh, mom and dad love child number one way more than they love me. Each of your children are unique. You treat them according to their uniqueness. You love each of them. They're just not the same. You know, I could start going through my children, Johanna, Jedediah, Cassandra, Ashley, Nick. Every one of them is different. Each one of them has some strong points the others don't, and each one of them has some weak points the others don't. But love all of them. They're all really special to me. And I want a relationship with each of them, and I think they know that. That has to be true when it's not the disaster we're reading about today comes out. It happens. Jacob's favoritism complicates things. He loves Joseph more than any of his other sons. And probably part of the reason he loved Jacob or Joseph the most, Joseph's mother had died, remember? And so she's recently dead, and they had prayed and hoped and planned for Joseph for years before he arrived. And so when he finally showed up, it was natural that, Joseph, that Jacob had special affection for this child that he had wanted for so long. Remember, the only wife he actually wanted was Rachel. And so when this son is born to her, 
he holds a very special place in his heart. But instead of trying to treat Joseph pretty much the same way he did the others, unique and different, but special, he, he doesn't do that at all. In fact, look at verse 3. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful coat. Now some translations say a coat of many colors, some say a royal robe. We really don't know. The way the Hebrew is phrased, it's really kind of hard to tell exactly what it was. But here was the point. This is Dad's choice. He treated Joseph totally different than he treated any other child. And because of that, it wasn't unexpected that there was going to be conflict. And that's exactly what happens. As if that's not bad enough, Jacob, Joseph gives this bad report to his dad. And as if that's not enough, probably the straw that broke the camel's back was Joseph has these dreams. And pardon me, but he just wasn't wise enough yet to keep his mouth shut. Let me be really clear. You don't have to say everything you know. Did you get that? You are not required to tell everything you know. These dreams were from God. He already knew his brothers were jealous. And so he goes to them already knowing of their jealousy and says, Hey, I had a dream. And in my dream, you bowed down to me. Now, isn't that, kind of a, isn't that going to create predictable problems? Now, Joseph is only 17 years old. He gets a little bit of a pass because he doesn't have a great deal of experience yet. But he has the one dream and he tells his brothers and they get mad. And then he has a second dream and so what does he do the second time? He tells them to say, he tells them that dream too. He didn't learn from the first experience. He really should have done that. These two dreams are so clear. In the first one, they're out in the field, they're gathering the harvest and they make these sheaves, you know, these tall grain things that are tied together. And all of his brother's sheaves gather around his and bow down to his. Really pretty clear the meaning of that one. And then he has a second dream a little later, and he says, I was, at, I was somewhere, and the moon and the stars bow down to me. Now, the moon and the stars apparently were references to his family. The moon, the sun, the moon, the 11 stars. The 11 stars are his 11, 11 siblings. I mean, really. He should have just kept his mouth shut, shouldn't he? Have you, ever kept, have you ever said something and you knew the instant it came out you should have just kept your mouth shut? <laughs> let, let me be really clear. You do not have to say everything you think, nor should you. In fact, sometimes you can even have the truth and if you know the truth is not going to be accepted, you're under no obligation to share it. Let me tell you why I say that, not just from this story. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus made a profound statement. He said, don't cast your pearls before the swine. Now why do you not throw pearls into a pig pen? Would pearls, would pearls be recognized as valuable for, to pigs? Are pearls valuable? Absolutely. But the pigs would have no way of comprehending that. They wouldn't appreciate it. And Jesus' point was simply this. You are not obligated to tell someone the truth if you know in advance that this holy truth that you're going to share is going to be rejected and not acknowledged as truth. I learned this lesson personally when I was going through my divorce. Sometimes I had things to say that I knew were true, but I also knew that no matter what I said, it wasn't going to be accepted. So I chose to keep those things to myself. There are times that with people who are being argumentative, you just keep the truth to yourself because it doesn't matter what you say. They're not arguing with the facts. They're arguing with you. And when that happens, then you don't put out those things which are true, even though you know they are true, because you know they're going to be trampled. They're going to be like this. Joseph in this situation was not wrong to know the truth. He was right, but he didn't have to tell everything he knew. In fact, 
here's one of the ways you can kind of use to help you determine what to pass along and what not to pass along. Look at this next statement in your notes. We must be careful when it comes to sharing things that will make us look good and others look bad. Especially those kinds of things. If you're sharing something that will make you look really, really great and will look, make the other person look really, really bad, be really careful. When Joseph told his brothers about the dream, their response is swift and predictable. They hate him more than ever before. And this is where those real family tensions start to come out. Joseph wasn't wrong to share his dreams, but he also wasn't wise. In fact, he told his father and Jacob rebuked, uh, rebuked Joseph, but he didn't hate him like his brothers did. He thought maybe there was really something to these dreams. Let's read the next section of the passage. Let's, read, let's pick up the story in verse 12 and we'll read through verse 30. Here's what it says. Soon after this, Joseph's brothers went to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem. When they had been gone for some time, Jacob sent to Joseph. Jacob said to Joseph, your brothers are pasturing the sheep at Shechem. Sheep at Shechem. Almost a tongue twister. Get ready and I will send you to them. I'm ready to go, Joseph replied. Go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting along, Jacob said. Then come back and bring me a report. So Joseph sent him on his way and Jacob traveled to Shechem from their home in the valley of Hebron. When he arrived there, a man from the area noticed him wandering around the country, said, what are you looking for, he asked. I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph replied. Do you know where they are pasturing, pasturing the, their sheep? Yes, the man told him, they've moved on from here. But I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph followed his brothers to Dothan and found them there. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Then just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. It was a group of Ishmaelite traders taking a load of gum, balm, and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain by killing our brothers? Our brother, his blood, would just give us a guilty conscience. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to these Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And the brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled out him out of the cistern, sold him for 20 pieces of silver, and the traders took him to Egypt. Sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the cistern. When he discovered that Joseph was missing, he tore his clothes in grief. Then he went back to his brothers and lamented, The boy is gone. What will I do now? Second major principle. We experience pain we don't anticipate. If you have lived for a long time, I can tell you that part of your life experience has been painful. You have gone through some times that you didn't know how to handle. You have gone through grief. You have gone through times of betrayal. You have gone through times when you didn't see it coming and then it hits you right in the face. Am I right? We've all been there. Jacob is there. Joseph is about to experience something he didn't expect. Jacob sending Joseph to check on his older brothers and the family flocks. He knew there was tension. He had created part of that tension by his favoritism. But he doesn't realize how deep it runs. When he sends Jacob out the door to find his other sons and the flocks, he has no idea that it will be more than 20 years before he will see Joseph again. Jacob's smart, but as intelligent as he was, he didn't know what was going to happen. And the same is true for us. Why did Jacob send Joseph to visit his brothers wearing that special coat? Because he didn't think anything was going to happen. The irony is that finding Jacob's sons and the flocks was, was a job that could have been handled by any servant. Jacob could have sent anybody to do it, but he sends the 17-year-old Joseph, probably with the intention of teaching his son what, how, to, how to kind of handle things. You know, sometimes we give our children jobs that we could much more easily do ourselves. 
because they need to learn. And that's what I think was going on here. Jacob could have given this job to another person to do, but he wants Joseph to begin getting involved with the flocks and learning what's going on. And so he sends J Joseph out to find these brothers. And based on the places named in the story, he thought his brothers, Jacob thought the brothers were in Shechem. Shechem's about 50 miles from home. So he goes, he makes this lengthy journey. He gets to Shechem and the brothers aren't there. Instead, they have moved from there to a place called Dotham, which is about another 15 miles further. Now, his brothers probably did what most of the cowboys did in the early days. They kind of led the cattle and they just followed the pasture land. It was all common ground, so to speak. Technically, it belonged to Terry and Kim, but you know what? It was open range, they called it in our country. An open range meant you could, you could pasture your flock, your herds, anywhere if they weren't fenced. It was open range. And the same kind of thing was happening in these ancient times. So they just kind of followed where there was good grass and they ended up in Dothan. Now when Joseph's brothers see him approaching, they quickly devised a plot. They saw him coming and one turned to the other and said, hey, you know what? And I'm going to paraphrase. The brat's not at home where dad can protect him. Let's just kill him. And before very long, if you've ever been around a group that gets out of control, there's a mob mentality that takes over. You, you see it happening with riots. There's this mob mentality that kicks in, and whereas people wouldn't do something on their own, they get in a large group, and the thinking changes, and there's this group think that goes on, and suddenly people who normally wouldn't do something are now right in the middle of doing something terrible. And so they all agree before Joseph gets to them that they will kick this kid's butt. They will throw him into this cistern, they will kill him. And then one of them speaks up, Reuben, who really is planning on taking Joseph back to dad, and says, listen, let's not kill him, let's just throw him in a cistern and leave him there to die. So then they agree on that, and when they get him, I think they beat him up, they throw him in the cistern, they rip off his fancy clothes, which were this symbol that provoked such hatred among them, And then they sat down to eat. Verse 19, he was, they said, here comes the dreamer. Literally the phrase could be, here comes the dream expert. They devised this plan, this plot to kill him. Joseph didn't see it coming. Jacob didn't see it coming. In fact, if you have ever been betrayed, you know the pain that Jacob and Joseph would have felt. I like this statement, we don't know who exactly made it, but it's a really true statement. It's the next one in your notes. The saddest thing about betrayal is that it never comes from your enemies. Betrayal by definition means someone you trusted let you down. Joseph's life spared by Reuben, as I said a few minutes ago. He intended to come back and send him back to dad. Reuben warned them not to shed blood because they were brothers, and he suggested that throwing him in the cistern was a better way to go. Now, it's difficult to understand how the brothers could sit down and calmly eat a meal when their brother was in an empty well. Now, we're not told this here, but we know from reading the end of Genesis that when Joseph was actually talking to his brothers and he didn't think, they didn't think he could understand their language, they were still feeling the guilt of Joseph begging for his life and them being calloused over 20 years later. This was an event that was burned forever into their conscience. They never forgot what had happened. Being cruel may seem appropriate in the moment, but it's never the right thing to do. And the brothers fall into that trap of being unconscionably cruel to Joseph. Joseph 
And there's, there's something interesting. They sit down and eat this meal, and Joseph is hungry in this cistern, which they're planning on leaving him in to die, to starve to death. And there's kind of an irony there. Joseph, what is Joseph going to do in Egypt? He's going to feed the world. And yet here he sits in an empty well, going hungry, while his brothers, perhaps the smell of the meal, goes through the air and goes down into this well, and he's hungry and there's nothing to eat. It's just, it's really, really ironic. But here's the problem. Sometimes people can do things that they will regret. Look at this next statement. Given the right circumstance and emotions, any of us could do something we cannot imagine. Have you ever surprised yourself by doing something dumb? Have you ever been disappointed in yourself because you did something you didn't think you could do? And when they see the caravan coming, the brothers begin talking among themselves and they say, hey, let's, let's, pull, let's pull Joseph out of the cistern. Let's sell him to these traders. After all, it's better we sell him to the traders than we just leave him here to die. Plus, we'll get a little something out of it. And they sold him for 20 shekels. Anybody want to guess how much 20 shekels is? This is silver. Guess how many... Guess, how, guess what the weight is of 20 shekels of silver. Anybody want to guess? Eight ounces. Almost nothing. Probably they had to sell Joseph at a discounted price because they were going to have to go to Egypt and they were going to have to sell him there. And it wasn't a very big price. They got almost nothing. These brothers, this is the, now we're, we're at the end of Jacob's central focus in the story. And Jacob has sent Joseph, and they basically give their brother away, selling him into slavery. Why? Why did all of that happen? Well, that's the final point in the message. Let's read verses 31 to 36, and then we will begin that last section. Then the brothers killed a young goat and dipped Joseph's, Joseph's, blood, Joseph's robe in its blood. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with this message, Look at what we found. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? Their father recognized it immediately. Yes, he said, it is my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him. Joseph has clearly been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes and dressed himself in burlap. He mourned deeply for his son for a long time. His family all tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. I will go to my grave mourning for my son, he would say, and then he would weep. Meanwhile, the Midianite traders arrived in Egypt where they sold Joseph to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Potiphar was captain of the palace guard. Final principle. We can see God at work in our lives. The brother's story is, un, is, is well, it's believable especially because it involved their brother's distinctive robe. Isn't it ironic that the robe which had demonstrated how much Joseph was loved was finally the robe which demonstrated he was actually dead? It's kind of interesting because dipped in blood in a sacrificial system indicated innocence. And these brothers were anything but innocent. They had failed miserably. And so a young goat's slaughtered, and it's used in the deception. Right? You see it there? Verse 31, the brothers killed the young goat and dipped Joseph's blood, Joseph's robe in his blood. Does that bring back memories for anybody of anything else? How did we begin the story of Jacob? Second message, what did Jacob do? Him and his mother, they killed a young goat, they fixed the meat for his father, they used that young goat to deceive Isaac. Now it's the end of Jacob's life, and what's happening to him? 
he's being deceived with a young goat. Now, had God forgiven Jacob of that sin earlier in his life? Absolutely, he had. But let's be really clear. Consequences and forgiveness are not the same thing. They're not the same at all. You know, let me give you an example. If I eat too much, which I have done throughout most of my life, and I develop heart issues, God's not, per se, punishing me because he didn't forgive my sin of gluttony, but there are consequences with eating too much and not taking care of yourself. Make sense? Same thing's happening here. Jacob, by his favoritism, set in motion by his deception and setting this kind of example for his children, set in place a series of events which ultimately came back to haunt him. He reaped what he sowed. And that's exactly what was going on here. God's at work in his life. But it's not real obvious at the moment. The brothers then get this robe and they send it to Jacob. And it's interesting, they originally said, we're going to show dad and say, hey, an animal must have killed him. But then they came up with a better plan. Let's just send the robe covered with blood and dad will figure it out himself. We won't even have to lie. So they just take the robe and they send it with this message. Doesn't this robe belong to you? Or doesn't this robe belong to your son? It's interesting. If you found one of your brother or sister's clothes and you were going to send it back to your parents after death, how, how would you do that? You would say, you know, I, I, if it was my brother Jerry, who I'm very close to, I would send that to my parents if I was needing to send it to them for some reason and I would say, here's Jerry's coat. I wouldn't send it to them and say, hey, here's your son's clothes. You can sense the hostility even in the message. Here's your son's coat, Dad. Jacob takes one look at that coat. He sees it covered in blood. There was no mistaking the coat. It wasn't something common like anything you can find in your closet and mine. This was a one of a kind. And he's overwhelmed. So amazing. Let's get back to the story. Jacob is devastated by Joseph's apparent death. He tears his clothes, he dresses in sackcloth, and he mourns for his son. In that culture, tearing your clothes was a symbol of something being terribly, terribly wrong. Because it was typically a very impoverished society, and to tear your clothes meant something was incredibly wrong. That went on in almost every situation where grief was involved, but then he did something else. He refused to be comforted. Verse 35, his family all tried to comfort him. Isn't that what families do when there's a death? Don't you try to comfort one another? I mean, that's what happens when there's death. But it says, verse 35, he refused to be comforted. Now, in that culture, they did things a bit differently than we do. In that culture, they set aside a time for official grieving. The family would set aside a week or a month. And this is our period to grieve. It's not that everything will be over at the end of the month, but this is our time we're setting aside to grieve. It's just kind of the way the culture worked. But Jacob, as he deals with the apparent death of Joseph, because I'm not putting a time limit on it. I will grieve for the rest of my life. I will grieve for Joseph until I die and meet him in the afterlife. He was heartbroken. He was torn. We would say he was a mess. But I want you to know, I want you to remember, this whole time Jacob is grieving, Joseph is still alive. It is not the way it appears to be. The reality was, in spite of how bleak things looked, God had a better outcome for Jacob and Joseph than they could dream. In fact, 22 years later, they would be reunited. Look at this next statement in your notes. 
No matter how impossible things may appear, God is in control and still has a plan. You and I may look at our lives and we may say, I can't see how God could bring anything good out of this. But God was going to bring something good out of this. I want you to notice something else. Something which the brothers hadn't counted on. Again, go back to verse 35. Let me read it again. His family all tried to comfort him. Were the brothers part of the all? Were the brothers part of the family? Absolutely. Finally, after seeing how dad wasn't just grieving, dad was, you know what, can I put it in a little different terminology? I think their dad aged into an old man before their eyes. They had wanted to kill Jake, Joseph, to get rid of this brat, is the way they saw him. But they didn't want to destroy their dad. But they had. And as they are there with him day after day trying to comfort him, and he is inconsolable. There's nothing they can say that will make things better. Well, actually, maybe there is. They could tell the truth. Oh, he's not really dead. But they can't pass that. They can't tell the truth. Because if they tell the truth, they will implicate themselves. And every day they see their father's life ruined. What do you think they felt? Guilty. That's the way sin is, guys. You never know how it's going to impact you or others. But it really works that way. Despite all of this, God's still working. It must have seemed that, to Jacob that everything was bad. But Joseph was rising through the ranks and becoming a leader in Egypt. Now, I'm not suggesting that God approved of the brothers' hatred and deception and selling their brother, because he certainly did not. But the reality is, God can use even the worst of things and bring good from them. God brought Joseph safely to Egypt, which is where he wanted him all along. Because Joseph is going to literally save the world of the time from starvation. That's where Joseph needs to be. God uses this atrocious, mean-spirited, hateful thing the brothers did to not only save Joseph, but to save the family of Abraham and to save the ancient world. In fact, Joseph is sold to Potiphar, who will put him in just the right place that eventually he will capture the eye of the Pharaoh himself. Ultimately, the story of Joseph is about God working through the everyday events of life and accomplishing his plans when it's impossible to see how he's going to do it. You know, some of the stories in the Old Testament are full of miracles. Let me be really clear. God does miracles. That's, I'm not saying he does not. When you read the story of the ten plagues and you hear, you read the story of the Exodus and how God did miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle as he delivered the Israelites from the Egyptians, let me be really clear. Those are all miracles of epic proportion. But when you read this story, there's no obvious miracles other than God's sovereignty and timing. God's not raining down manna. He's not producing water from rocks. He's not parting the Red Sea. He's not sending plagues on some nation. He's just quietly working in the background. Occasionally, we're going to see God do amazing things. But most of the time, God works in the background. He's working. We just don't see it unless we're looking. And even when you're looking, you don't always see it immediately. That's what's going on here. God's working in the background. He's got something going on. Look at this last statement in your notes. God can take bad things and use them to accomplish things that are incredibly good. Now recently we as a church have experienced the confusion and discomfort of trying to follow God when every place we're following seems to get a door closed. Repeatedly, we thought we had things worked out. And then the door slams. It's clear in Jacob's story 
that sometimes when we are following God, things go in directions we would never dream. Now, our part of the story will never be fully understood while we're living it. Let me tell you, part of what we're reading in the story of Jacob made no sense to Jacob because he didn't see the end. Some of the things going on in our church family, I don't understand because I don't see the end. Jacob's story makes really good sense to me, doesn't it you? I mean, I see how it all turns out. I see how Joseph ends up in Egypt, how he becomes the, the grand vizier, the number two guy in the whole kingdom, how he saves the ancient world. I see then how God protects the nation of Israel for 400 years in Egypt, even though they're in slavery, they're protected from anybody else attacking them, till they grow to approximately a size of three million people, and they're protected by the strongest power in the world. And then God sends ten plagues, and he delivers them, and they move back to the promised land. And then there's Solomon, and there's King David. And later through that family will come Jesus. Did Jacob know any of that stuff? Not a bit of it. All he was responsible to do was follow God in the experience that he had. I don't know what God's going to do through the refuge. We may never get a bit bigger than we are. But if lives are changed and God uses us to touch others, then that's a good thing. We didn't see this happening, did we? That we were going to lose our building? You want to be completely honest about it? We didn't see ourselves getting this building in the first place. And then we had all these plans. Valley View, door slams. S&P property, door slams. Churches we've talked to, door slams. Arnold Rec Center, door slams. Now there's an open door. We're walking through it. Met with the principal of the school. They're delighted to have us there. I'm going to be showing up on the 13th of December and taking donuts and coffee and hot chocolate to the teachers. I don't know what's going to come out of all this, but I'm absolutely convinced all we can do when we don't know what to do is follow the door God opens. So that's what we're going to do. And when we do that, I'm absolutely convinced God does things that you and I cannot begin to imagine because he's God. Now, we are responsible to take the next step in following. Some of you, that probably means you need to take the first step. You just need to invite him into your heart. Commit your life to him. Ask him to forgive your sins. Begin your spiritual journey. Others of us, we've already done that, and now we need to just passionately continue following. We need to recommit ourselves to following him when it just frankly doesn't make any sense. Wherever you're at, that's what you need to do. Would you join me please as we pray? God, open our hearts and minds to your message. Thank you for the life of Jacob. That time after time when things make no sense to him, you have a bigger plan, a bigger picture going on that he's totally unaware of. And yet, when he followed you, you took care of it all. Even when he followed you incredibly imperfectly. God, please use us in your plans. Touch others as you work through us in our imperfections, and yet through our love for you. In your name we pray.